Let's pray together, and you may be seated. Father in heaven, thank you for not putting on us the burden, responsibility, the, the effort on us to come find you, to clean ourselves up, to approach you in our own strength, in our own unrighteousness, trying to stop being such unrighteous people, Lord, but instead, just in your grace, in your undeserved favor towards sinners, you took the first step and many, many more countless steps towards us, and now we have an approach and an access, an introduction every day into this grace in which we stand. Lord, how good you are, how kind you are to draw near to us. Would you help us now as we have your word open to draw near to you, Lord, continue our worship in the study of your word. Show us who you are as our God who made peace with us through the blood of Christ, and it's in his name we pray, amen. Please turn in your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5. We have an amazing passage before us this morning. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, starts off very familiar. If you've been a part of our study through Romans 1, 2, 3, and 4 so far, these first few words in Romans 5, 1 are not surprising to you. Therefore, having been justified by faith. (laughs) That's everything Paul's been talking about. And justification by faith, in one sense, is a very lonely doctrine. Paul labored so diligently in Romans 1 through 4 so that we would see that it stands alone as the only way that an ungodly sinner could ever attain a favorable position with God in salvation. Nothing else can be added to faith when it comes to gaining or receiving God's righteous status over our lives. God doesn't give his righteous status to the ungodly who believes and say at the same time, and why don't you add some law to that and get to work with that law and add some religious ceremony to that faith? God doesn't do that. It is justification by faith alone in Christ alone for the ungodly, and there is no other salvation Outside of that, at the end of Romans 4, as justified ones look back on God's saving work in our lives, there's only one thing we can see. There's only one thing that God's grace focused us on, and that was justification by faith alone and nothing else. But now in chapter 5, Paul is ready to turn justified ones around and look forward into the Christian life. He's ready now to turn you forward, believer, and let you look ahead into your Christian life. Therefore, having been justified by faith, dot, 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 that's the statement that does two things. It assumes everything that Paul has taught for the last four chapters in Romans But it also is a statement that turns you now and lets you look into this new life that you have with Christ by God's grace. And what we're going to discover in Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, really, is that for the believer in Jesus Christ, in this new life in Christ now, justification by faith alone is not so lonely anymore. Look back on how you were saved And you'll only see one key doctrine, justification by faith alone. God's grace gets you to that only. But look forward into your new life in Christ, and you quickly see that justification by faith alone is accompanied by every grace benefit that you will ever need for your Christian life. Only one thing was needed for your salvation as an ungodly man or woman. It was justification by faith alone. But now you discover in Romans 5 and following that your justification by faith is surrounded. It is accompanied by countless benefits for living a life that is pleasing to Jesus Christ. 
So Romans 5.1 begins with this statement. Therefore, having been justified by faith, and that signals that it's time to consider the many benefits that accompany justification by faith alone. When God's grace visited you and you were justified as a gift by his grace, Romans 3.24, that same grace supplied for you every other benefit you need to live the Christian life. And the first benefit for the justified one is worship. Worship. Worship of God. Three times in these verses, in 5, 1 to 11, you see the verb exult. Exult. It, it means to boast in. It means to be jubilant in triumphant rejoicing. It's a strong word. It's a worshipful expression of overwhelming joy and satisfaction. Look at verse 2 at the end. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And then look at verse 3. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. Look at verse 11. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the reconciliation. There's nothing ho-hum about this word exult. It's to be caught up in the greatness of who God is, God our Savior, and then to fervently boast in him to just want to talk about him, to just want to see him be magnified, to be swallowed up in what he is and who he is towards us. So Romans 5, 1 to 11 contains three catalysts that compel those justified by faith in Jesus to boast. We're compelled to boast in God. First, three catalysts compel us to worship God because we're justified because we're justified, let me read it to you this morning, Romans 5, 1 to 11. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope in the of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So today, what we'll talk about and get cover this morning are the first two catalysts. The first two catalysts, because they're really related to each other. And so the bigger idea in 5, 1 to 11, is exulting in God. Boasting in him who saved us. That's the benefit of justification for us. God's concerned to make sure that we are worshipers of him. And now to get us to that exultant worship, justification by faith alone has three catalysts to get us there, okay? Number one, the first catalyst is peace with God. Peace with God. Romans 5, 1 and 2 
has two main statements that go together. The first one is, we have peace with God. That's the first main statement. And then the next main statement after that is, and, verse, verse two, we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Peace with God is the catalyst that gets us to triumphantly worship and rejoice in God. And everything between those two main statements fleshes out the peace with God that we have, and it shows us how it compels justified ones to boast in God. Peace with God, verse one. That presupposes something, doesn't it? What does it presuppose? That at one time we, what? We were enemies with him. We were hostile toward him. We had at one time great conflict with God. Do you remember this? Just go back a few chapters. Let's just remind ourselves. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Wrath for us. And then those three terrifying statements, God gave them over, God gave them over, God gave them over in verses 24, 26, and 28. That's God's holy judicial hand on our back, thrusting us into our prison cells of unrighteousness to commit further unrighteousness, and it just we store up wrath for ourselves. Chapter 2, verse 2, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. Judgment is rightly falling. We all know it. On us, we are in trouble. Verse three, in judging others, we suppose that we'll escape the judgment of God. We know we want to get away from that judgment. We're in trouble and we know it. Verse five, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Verse six, he'll render to each person according to his deeds. Look at the last part of verse 8, wrath and indignation. This is not good news for us. We are in trouble with God. Verse 9, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or if you're a non-Jew. Verse 11, there is no partiality with God. He will be painfully consistent. Verse 16, There's a day coming when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. Halfway through there, the God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? The answer is no. He inflicts wrath. Verse 6, how will God judge the world? He will judge the world. Verse 17, the path of peace they have not known. We don't know that path of peace without Christ. Verse 19, every mouth closed, all the world accountable to God. And then even if you look in chapter 5, verse 10, we were enemies. But now, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And what what Paul is emphasizing here is not so much the feeling of peacefulness, with God, but just the plain fact that God is no longer waging his holy war of wrath against us. We have a life reconciled to God. Enmity with God has been taken away because of justification by faith. The war against God is over for the one who believes. We're not haters of God anymore, Romans chapter 1. God has nothing against you, believer. Look at chapter 3, verse 25. Whom God displayed publicly, or God displayed him, Jesus, publicly as a propitiation, as a wrath-removing, wrath-satisfying death in his blood through faith. God has nothing against you, believer, because God fully and entirely put your sin on his son at the cross. There's not one act, there's not one thought of rebellion left off of the innocent son of God at the cross. All of them, all of your rebellions were placed on him and then God God poured out all of his wrath on his son. He fully and entirely judged his son in your place. 
There's not one drop of unspent wrath hidden away somewhere in God that he might find sometime and then direct it towards you. All of the cup of wrath was poured out on Christ. He drank it all down. He drank it dry. The cup of wrath is dusty, dry toward you, believer, and forever it will remain so. You have peace with God as a justified one. He made peace with you through the blood of his son, and God will eternally remain at peace with you, never changing his mind toward you. He is forever at rest with you, believer. His son's shed blood forever finished God's holy war against you. And notice we have peace with God, chapter 5, verse 1, through our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have the, the fact of peace with God through something else or someone else other than Jesus. The holy war God was engaged in against you, it couldn't be brought to an end through another way or another path or another person. It came only through Christ. Look over at chapter 5, verse 10. The first part there, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Verse 11, the last part there, through whom, through him, we have now received the reconciliation. Jesus is the means through which peace with God comes. 5.1, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul now expands on our peace in verse 2. Let me unpack this important statement, then I'll show you how it's an expansion on the kind of peace we have because it's an amazing statement. Look at verse 2. Through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Notice with me first, we have obtained our introduction by faith. That word introduction, I think, is better translated access. We have obtained our access, our approach, our approach. I like that better because that captures the ongoing nature of what is said. Access or approach has been obtained for us, and we still have access or approach every day. And the idea behind this word introduction or access or approach was that of a, a king sitting in his audience chamber, and he would grant the servant of his choice permission or the privilege to approach him. The king would give to his subject access or approach to his own presence. And this is what we have. This is what we have as those justified. We have obtained that, our approach through faith. But we have access or approach continually in an ongoing way, look in verse 2, into this grace in which we stand. And Paul is very specific. It's this grace. And you say, well, what grace is that? It's the grace from chapter 3, verse 24 that he talked about. Look at it. Being justified as a gift by his grace. It's that grace. That grace that did that for us in justification. Grace is his undeserved favor. And grace becomes a nice word to transition to now in chapter 5. That grace put justification in the spotlight in chapters 1 to 4. Grace from here forward refers to that which brings about all of our undeserved benefits in salvation that began with justification by faith. So here's what's being said in verse 2. The doors to grace's throne room, so to speak, have been thrown wide open, and we have access or we have approach to this enthroned grace in which we stand. And the idea of standing there has the idea of firmness or stability. Listen, we're not tottering in grace. We're not wobbling in God's grace. We are standing believers, firm Perhaps this is a clue as to what I think uh, Paul meant in Romans chapter 1, 11, and verse 15 when he said, I want to come because I want to establish you. 
Chapter 16, verse 25, at the end of the letter, now to God who will establish you according to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be established? It means we're in this grace in which we are standing. We are firm. And notice again that our access or approach to God's grace, it cannot and does not happen apart from Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. It's through him also that we have obtained our access or our approach by faith into this grace in which we now stand. It doesn't come to us by any other route or any other person. Now, how how is all of this an expansion on peace with God? What does it tell us about the kind of peace that we as believers now have with God? Well, let me take you to a human court, like our, our court system, to contrast it first. A human judge in our court system and a pardoned criminal, there never is really a relationship between them, right? I mean, the pardoned criminal, he never wants to see the judge again. He just wants his pardon and he wants to go. And the judge, when he leaves his office at the end of the day and goes to the parking garage and gets in his car, he doesn't want to see the pardoned criminal right? A judge prefers to not have any outside contact with the pardoned criminal. Listen, it is not this way with our God. Between God and his justified ones, the ones who are acquitted, there is a true and personal relationship. God acquitted us. More than that, he not only just isn't putting any judgment against us, but he gave us his status of righteousness so that when he sees it, he rejoices in it because it's what he is. And there's a true personal relationship. God acquitted us. He gave us his own righteous status through faith. He didn't do that and then say, you know what, I'd really be okay if you just kind of stayed away over there. Uh, don't, Don't become a stalker or anything like that, Okay. He is not that way. We have the door to God's enthroned grace wide open. The invitation to continually come is extended over and over. We we get to gain access access into the very presence of God's enthroned grace. He wants us near. He wants us to enter into deeper dimensions of his enthroned grace in which we are standing firm right now, not wobbling. And that kind of peace, that's a different kind of peace. That's a very intimate peace. That kind of approachable peace we have with God through Jesus, that's a catalyst for boasting. And that's what Paul says next at the end of verse 2. And all of that, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. We presently have this kind of peace with God through Jesus. Presently we have this. That's right. And we exult in hope of one day the glory of God. We are jubilant in triumphant rejoicing. We are compelled into a worshipful expression of overwhelming joy and satisfaction because of the peace, the kind of peace we have with God. We exult in hope, verse 2. Hope in the Bible is the confident expectation of something we don't yet have. And there is no doubt laced in this hope. I put my winter grass in this weekend. I hope it comes up. That's worldly hope. There are expressions of doubt in that. That's what we mean as humans when we use our word hope. It is not that way with God. Biblical hope, the writers of Scripture never give the impression in hope that there is some doubt laced in there. Biblical hope is confident expectation in what we do not yet have. Listen, biblical hope, we don't have biblical hope that maybe we will have faith. We don't hope for justification. We're not hoping for peace with God. We're not hoping for grace. We're not hoping for access to more grace. No, we have all those things. 
But there's something we long for as justified ones, something we long for that we don't have it yet and we have confident expectation of. What is it? Look at it with me. Verse 2, we hope or we, we exult in hope of the glory of God. God's glory. Confident expectation of that. We have confident expectation of something we don't have but are worshipfully eager to see and gaze upon one day. God's glory. God's glory in Scripture is his weightiness, his impressiveness, his overwhelmingness as God and Savior. Everything that is majestic about him, and it's often expressed through radiant, brilliant light. Do you know what you used to think about God's glory before Christ? Do you remember? Go back to chapter 1, verse 22. Here's what we were as sinners apart from Jesus Christ. Romans 1, 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. What was the foolish thing we did? And we exchanged the weighty impressiveness and overwhelmingness and majesty and brilliant splendor of God. We saw that and we didn't want it. Instead, we scribbled on a cave wall images like even a reptile and said, I like that better than the weightiness of God. That's what you and I were. That's what you and I thought about the glory of God before we were saved. And now, having been justified, as triumphant worshipers rejoicing in Jesus Christ, there's one thing we're dying to see, the glory of God. God in all of his glory. Now we worshipfully boast in confident expectation of one day getting to gaze on the glory of this God who made this kind of peace with us through Jesus Christ and then he he gave us a never-ending, unrestricted access to his grace that stabilizes us in this life and stands us up. The majestic, impressive, overwhelming, heavy, radiant splendor of God, we want to see that? That's right, we do. We want to see that God. We're worshipers who boast in the confident expectation we'll see his glory. Listen, we are different now that we are saved. We are different. We're not, we're not just different. We're the opposite of what we were. Jesus didn't come and tweak our lives. We didn't say, you know, I've got a pretty good life. I'm just going to add Jesus to my life. You didn't do that. If you did that, you're in big trouble because you haven't changed because that won't change you. But this takes somebody who would take God's weightiness and throw it away and worship anything and everything else except him and now make him into one who just, I just hope I'm gonna, I have confident expectation to see the glory of God. That's a change. Peace with God is a catalyst to boasting in God. And do you notice the first thing God is concerned with upon justifying you by faith is making you into a strong standing worshiper of God? That's the first thing out of the gates in chapter 5. And remember, it's not like you weren't a worshiper before you were a Christian, but now God saved you and he made you into a worshiper. Do you remember what you were before? Go back to Romans chapter 1 again. Paul keeps tying themes together here. Go back to Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. We didn't glorify him. Look at chapter 1, verse 25. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Listen, in our rebellion against God, we didn't say, I'm done being a worshiper. That's not what we said. In our rebellion, we just said, I'm just not going to worship you, but I'm going to worship anything and everything else I can. We exult in hope of the glory of God. Our thoughts on justification by faith, our meditations on justification they need to not terminate in us. Wow, it 
it's great to be saved. It is, by the way. <laughs> but our thoughts need to terminate in him, the God of all glory. The first catalyst that compels those justified by faith to boast in God is peace with God. We have peace with God and <laughs> exult in hope of the glory of God. The second catalyst that compels those justified to boast in God is this, number two, tribulations in life. Maybe we should just skip this part. Should we finish early and go get some lunch? Because it's about tribulations in life. Look what he says in verse three of chapter five. And not only this, but we also, in other words, and we exult in hope of the glory of God, and not only this, but we exult in our tribulations. What? It's like Paul just substituted out the word hope in 5.2, and he put in instead our tribulations, as if hope and our tribulations are just interchangeable, equal things that you can just put one in and then take the other one out. Remember the idea of exalt? We boast in our tribulations. We want to be jubilant and triumphant, rejoicing in our tribulations. A worshipful expression of overwhelming joy and satisfaction in our tribulations. How can that be? How can that be? The only way we could be able to boast in worship in our tribulations, like we worship and boast in hope, is if our tribulations get us to the same hope. And that's exactly the point. Look at verses three and four. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character, and proven character what? Hope. That's not the way you thought you'd get there, but that's what God has for us by design. And this hope, verse 5, won't disappoint us, even if we have to take the longer way there through tribulations. Let's walk through this. Tribulations. It, it, it carries with it the idea of pressure. Pressure. An affliction that is heavy on you and pressing down on you, squeezing you like when you squeeze grapes to get juice. The afflictions that press down on believers like that may be perilous circumstances, in this broken world, all of the way to persecution for believing Christ. We all live in a broken world full of perils unseen that press down on us. And, and this broken world is not very sensitive to your plight. Nor are worldly ones, ungodly ones, sympathetic to your faith in Jesus. And so tribulations come in this world. Jesus said that. Pressures weigh us down. And this is so helpful what Paul says here. Paul knows that just because our God makes peace with us through the death of Jesus, that doesn't mean that the world is now at peace with us or that unbelievers are at peace with us. He acknowledges this. And if anybody understood tribulations while having peace with God, it would be Paul. But don't miss this about your worship of God. Your worship of God as one who's justified is not conditioned upon a smooth life where everybody affirms you. Worship doesn't need that requirement first and then you can be an exalter. If you know this truth, 5.3, your perspective on tribulations and worship coexisting at the same time will baffle the onlooking world, and it might even surprise you. But you must know this. Do you see that in verse 3? And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that. Knowing what? Knowing this about tribulations, you must know that they are not designed by God to be worship killers in your life. And you must not only know this about God's design for tribulations, but you need to believe him about it. Believe what he says about his design for them, and that it's true. Tribulations can get me to hope, confident expectation in him. Do you know that tribulations 
bring about perseverance, verse 3. The justified one who is no longer at war with God, who is standing firm in God's grace, who confidently expects one day to gaze on God's glory, is now in a trial and is persevering. Perseveres means uh, to, to bear up under it. It's like putting your shoulder onto the pressure that's coming down and to bear up and to put pressure back against the pressure coming down on you in the tribulation. You stand resisting the pressure, pushing back against it. It means the justified one doesn't just collapse under it and curl up into the fetal position and be passive about it. Instead, the justified one finds strength. Somehow he's standing already, right, in grace. Standing and finds strength from God to keep pushing back up against the tribulation. You know this is God's design for you, believer. Take God at his word. Trust him that you will persevere. You can persevere. And that you can do it not with this grimacing face, wincing, but with joyful worship in your tribulation. You'll somehow find strength to exult as you exert pressure back on the tribulation pressing down on you. Don't take your tribulations lying down. Daily tell yourself what you must know about what God designed for you in tribulations. They are not there to weaken you. They're there to strengthen you, to strengthen your resolve to press back up against them and stand. By the way, whoever learns perseverance at their birthday party? On your wedding day, did you learn perseverance? No, it was the best day of your life after getting saved. But in great loss. Being persecuted for following Christ. That's when we build persevering spiritual muscle to hold up against the tribulation. But there's more. Do you know that perseverance brings about proven character? Do you see that in verse 4? The idea is that you, you bear up and you're pushing back on the tribulations of life. When you do that, your character gets tested and refined and purified. The verb form of proven character is the word that refers to the process by which you would take a a precious piece of metal and test it by fire so that the impurities in it can be come to the top and be taken away so that what results in the fire is something that's even more valuable than it initially was. So the whole point of putting a fire to it is to not destroy it, but to make it what? Even more valuable, even better. That's God's design for you and me. As believers in Jesus Christ, he wants to test your character, to refine away impurities so that what's left in your character is better than it was before, proven character. As a justified one, God is concerned for your character right now. He is. And it doesn't grow on your birthday very much, maybe a little. But get into the pressure of a tribulation, get into the furnace of affliction, and as you learn to stand up firm and push back with resistance against the tribulation, your character changes. But there's more. Do you know that proven character brings about hope, verse 4? And do you see how we got all the way back to hope? That's not the way you thought you should take to get to Hope's house, but you can trust God on how to get there. The better your character becomes through tribulations and perseverance, you become better equipped to express confident expectation. 
Hope doesn't get better. You get better at expressing hope. And that's what God is after. That's what he's after. The better your character becomes through trials and the perseverance, the more confident expectation you'll have in your Savior. You become a better hoper. And notice what Paul says about this hope that you'll be exercising from improved character in tribulations. Look at verse 5. And hope does not disappoint. That means it won't shame you. This hope, it won't shame you. It won't disgrace you. It won't even chide you for having a deficient character that needs improving. This confident expectation in God, it won't disappoint you in a life full of tribulations, nor will it disappoint you or shame you because your character still has some impurities in it that need to be refined out. The reason this hope won't disappoint you or disgrace you is, verse 5, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Because the love of God is poured out within our hearts. The idea of being poured out means that God lavishes his love on us in abundance. He doesn't leak his love on you. He lavishes his love for you on you. He abundantly pours out his love on you. And in your tribulations and perseverance and in that character development that goes on in there, he is communicating his love for you in overflowing expressions and your hope swells up. Your confident expectation rides high on the crest of the wave of his overflowing love for you. And notice that this love poured out is experienced in your heart. Verse 5, the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. It's the inner man. It's who you are inwardly before God. A spray on love from God won't do. But a flood of his love for you in your inner man. And this is the first mention of the Holy Spirit He won't do any of that apart from his spirit. That comes through the Holy Spirit. That's really a precious statement made about him, the first one in the book. Through him comes a torrent of of love from God for you, which bolsters you to express confident expectation in him such that you aren't ashamed, even though your character is still in need of some refining, some improvement, some maturing in your tribulation. This is really amazing. Think about the kind of God that saved us. Think about who our God is. Our character isn't what it ought to be. So tribulations and perseverance work on our character. And while we see impurities in our character come out because we're getting squeezed and stuff comes out when you get squeezed, doesn't it? And even though we see those impurities come out in our character and they rise to the surface and like in the tribulation fire, God makes you aware of, I love you. I love you. You don't bug me. I love you. I'm at work in your life. I'm refining your character. What a great God who would make never-ending expressions of his love for us known to us. And in so doing, we become better hopers. And herein really lies the massive difference between the unbeliever and the believer in this world. Listen, both have tribulations. If you've got this idea in your mind that maybe if you do something right in your Christian life, you won't have tribulations anymore, you just need to stop that now. You just need to stop it. Unbelievers and believers, everybody has tribulations. What makes the Christian different is not that he has no tribulations anymore, but the unbeliever does. No, the difference between the unbeliever and the believer is how God uses the tribulation in the life of the believer, right? The 
the believer becomes better in tribulations. Better in expressing biblical hope, better in persevering, better in character, better in worship. The believer becomes better in tribulations. Oftentimes, the unbeliever becomes bitter in tribulations. And that's a good way to maybe measure yourself this morning. Under life's tribulations, are you becoming better? Or are you becoming bitter? You, you don't deserve this. There's just a lot of people around you making life very difficult for you. Why did God do that to me? That's not becoming better. In the way that Romans 5, 1 to 5 talks about. God sends tribulations to us who believe, and we still worship him. We still worship him. And we grow in character, and he communicates to us in those trying times how much he loves us. His indwelling spirit holds none of that love back from us. And that spirit we did not merit, but he was given to us, verse 5. And our confident expectation swells, and we exult in the God of great glory. We worship. So peace with God is a catalyst compelling those justified by faith to boast in God. But so are our tribulations. That's a change of mind, isn't it, for us? I needed that. You need it too. They are a catalyst compelling us to boast in God. Give some thought in your life to what effect tribulations have been having on you? What have you been thinking about them? Has there been grumbling that's been coming, complaining? When you understand this, when you know this, verse three, everything changes. I see what you're doing. God, I see what you're doing. Now, I'm gonna need some perseverance. And then your character will change. And worship will be better. And listen, believer, this is, this is so helpful. Tribulations are not ruling your life. Tribulations are not the despot over you. Tribulations do not get to have the final say over you. Paul started with tribulations, but he didn't end there, did he? He ended in hope. Tribulation is not king. Tribulations are servants of God designed to help us grow. Do you know that? Verse three. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, I, on a bad day when I am not thinking the, rightly and your word is not central in my thoughts, I, I cling to worldly hope that is laced full of doubt. And I say really, really silly things like, I hope tribulations won't come my way. But I look in our church family and I, I see tribulations have come. And my flesh still hopes with a hope laced with doubt that they won't come to me. But yet, Lord, all I know is from these words here in Romans 5 and in many other places as well, James 1, the tribulations actually help me to hope in you better. And Father, when I'm thinking correctly and I look at the lives of those in our church family who have been through great tribulations, Lord, I see that to be true. They are becoming better. Father, help us to press this deep into our minds so that we know it intuitively and grow our faith in you that we just not know it, but we also believe you that it's true, that we can exult in our tribulations, just like we exult in hope of the glory of God one day. And we ask it in Christ's name.